You know that monotonous, soul-sucking, mind-numbing stretch of road, 59, between Houston and Victoria, punctuated only by Hilgy beef jerky in the towns of Edna, Louise, and Inez? You know, when you see the signs for Telfner, Victoria is close and your soul may be saved. Or maybe that's just me. I hate that stretch of road. Now, I always thought those towns were generic railroad towns, you know, towns that railroads passed by. But it turns out that their history is full of Italian royalty, piles of money, and dreams of railroad empire. Okay, whenever my grandfather drove from the coastal bend up to Houston, without fail, he would stop at a payphone, call my grandmother, and tell her, just deadpan, Hey, Cheryl, I'm going to spend the night in Louise, okay? (laughs) Yeah, it's tacky. Every single time, she fell for it, so obviously he just kept right on doing it. He did the same thing with the town of Donna down in the valley. I honestly believe my grandmother went to her grave thinking my granddad had two side pieces named Louise and Donna. Now, these towns in Jackson and Morton County have pedestrian-sounding names, but they actually have a dazzling past. Their story begins in the most unlikely place, northern Italy, where Giuseppe Telfner was born in 1839. Am I pronouncing his name the way he did? Eh, Who the hell knows? Probably not. The Texas town that's named for him is pronounced Telfner, but maybe the Italians pronounced it Telfner. Telfener. I don't know. With apologies to Mark, who's of uh, Sicilian descent and is in the studio today for microaggressing against him and his people. Anywho, Giuseppe studied math and engineering in Naples. He dabbled in railroad engineering, that is the design and building of railroads, not piloting trains. By the time he was 30, he'd formed a company and built a railroad in Italy and then turned his gaze to Argentina, where the government was just itching to use some import taxes to pay for new rail construction. Telfner helped him out, built 400 miles of rail there, and wrapped up his work in 1876, returning to Italy a much wealthier man. The king gave him the title of Count, and not long after that, he met, fell in love with, and married an American woman, Ada Hungerford, in Rome. Now, one has to keep one's wife in proper fashion, so he bought an estate from the Italian royal family smack in the middle of Rome and named it Villa Ada, or Via Ada for Mark. Via Ada retains that name today, by the way. It's the second largest public park in Rome, and the castle-like home on its grounds where the Telfners live now serves as the Egyptian embassy. Domestic life and keeping house or keeping castle was fine and all that, but Telfner hadn't built anything in a few years and was feeling kind of restless. He channeled that antsy energy toward a plan to build a railroad in Texas. Now, why Texas? Nobody's sure, but his new wife probably played a role. Her father was Daniel Hungerford, and he'd come through Texas during his service in the Mexican-American War. He'd also met some Texans during his time as a 49er in California, so he knew a little about the place and about the people. Now, this was the Count's plan. He would import 1,000 or 1,200 skilled Italian laborers, such as those he worked with when he built his first railroad in Italy. Then he'd sell them parcels of land next to the railroad so they'd always be on hand to maintain it. They'd get a new start in the wide open spaces of Texas and he would have a steady stream of railroad employees, plus he'd make a tidy profit on the sale of the land. So he formed a corporation in Europe with his father-in-law and brother-in-law and then set sail for the United States aboard the ship Algeria in August 1880. They called their new venture the New York, Texas, and Mexican Railway because ultimately Telfner's dream was for the road to run from New York straight to Mexico City. And in 1881, the Italian laborers began arriving at the port of Galveston. Things are all going as planned, and the first track was to be laid near Rosenberg Junction. By 1882, Giuseppe was calling himself Joseph, you know, for the locals, and by 1883, the road, now called the Macaroni Line by all the locals, was complete from Rosenberg to Victoria. Stops along the way were named for people who were dear to Telfner, Hungerford was named for his wife's family and was to be called Hungerfordville. Louise was named for his sister-in-law. Inez and Edna for his two daughters. They were to be called Inez City and Edna City. McKay was named for his brother-in-law. Telfner City was planned for Cameron County, but ended up at the end of the line near Victoria. It was obviously named for the Count, but his name was misspelled on a road sign, and that alternate spelling remains 
to this day. As the count was seen more and more out and about along the Texas coast, well, obviously tongues started wagging. The papers could not get enough of the worldly courteous Italian count. He was just so dang exotic. An 1883 Galveston piece captures the spirit of it all pretty well. His dark, sparkling Italian eyes, crowned with an elevated cornice of forehead, give evidence of genius, while his general action of person is at once so easy, graceful, and rapid as to indicate dashed determination and enterprise. He is a man of the world, a man of this century, a man of this age. A piece a year later, in a Galveston newspaper, absolutely swooned. In appearance, he's the beau of Italian beauty. The beautifully shaped oval head, the long eagle nose, the intensely dark bushy beard, the thick, glossy, downy hair, carefully parted and always redolent of lovely perfume, and most attractive of all, the eyes, soft and innocent as those of a gazelle, must create havoc in feminine hearts. Yet yeah, 19th century descriptions. Construction on the macaroni line was supposed to work this way. Start in Rosenberg, start in Victoria, and build towards each other. Now, the Count wasn't feeling the idea of living in Rosenberg, a tent city. He was, after all, a man of the world, a man of this time, right? So he took to lodging in Victoria, where he hired a chef to serve him European delicacies and fancy desserts each and every day. Think beef tenderloin swimming in truffle shavings and funky ragouts all the time. He imported Turkish coffee and wines from Europe because the Count had a peculiar distrust of foreign wines or spirits that he himself had not purchased. So he traveled with a private beverage stash everywhere he went. He drank French wine with breakfast, chased it with Turkish coffee, and only then did he start his day. A French music composer living in Victoria even named a waltz for the Count. The sheet music featured a family photo of the Telfners on the front cover and a list of the names of the Italian railroad workers on the back. So Count Joseph was popular and had laid a fair chunk of rail. It looked as though he was going to become a fixture in Texas until the legislature intervened. You see, Texas land was still relatively cheap in 1880 when the Macaroni Line saga began, but Telfner had gotten 16 sections of land, like 10,000 acres or so, for every mile of rail he built, according to Texas law at the time. Now, he'd completed 91 miles of track when the state law changed again in 1882. Texas, it seems, had overextended herself, giving away millions more acres of land than she had to give, mostly to wannabe railroad developers who would never develop anything. So Texas repealed the law, leaving Count Telfner to lay the rest of the track to Brownsville without any backing from the state government. So by this point in the story, he'd already purchased the land needed to build from Matamoros to Mexico City. He'd spent about $2 million to get trains moving from Rosenberg to Victoria. Meanwhile, his Italian laborers were weaving their way into the fabric of Texas, taking different jobs, starting families, leaving the railroad. The Count spent a couple of years trying to find a clear path to Brownsville. He even created an immigration company and published promotional materials extolling the virtues of Texas to try to lure Italians to the coastal bend, but to no avail. So he cut his losses. He sold his land to his brother-in-law, took his family, and went back to Italy to be royalty. Using some techniques he was toying with while he was in Texas, back in Europe, the Count patented a new type of rail and used it to create short lines that could climb steep grades up to, I think, 22 degrees. His new enterprise was built around this new rail system and was promoting Tuscany as an Italian Switzerland, hoping to attract elite vacationers to ski chalets with easy access through the mountains on his high-tech rail. But the Count was ahead of his time. Utilities weren't in place to support the tourism that the trains would bring, and so the company went bankrupt. Not long after, Count Giuseppe Telfner died in Italy in 1898, just shy of his 60th birthday. Cause of death? Unknown. Someone else picked up where he left off and eventually developed the resort area, which thrived until the First World War. What remains of the Count's presence in Texas can be seen on that drive from Houston to Victoria. Little did my granddad know that when he called my grandmother to make lewd jokes about 
Louise, he was rubbing elbows with European royalty. And it's a very Texas drive if you think about it, if you know the history, right? Rosenberg was named for a Swiss immigrant. El Campo was named by vaqueros who would stop off at a railroad camp there um, to get provisions. Edna, Inez, Louise, Hungerford, all named by an Italian count. Victoria is, of course, named for the first president of an independent Mexico. Pierce, along that same route, was named for Abel, Shanghai Pierce. Hilji owes its name to German and Czech settlers, and Ganado is Spanish for a herd of cattle. So, I hope this gives you something to think about next time you're making that boring, seemingly endless drive up or down Highway 59. Contemplate the Count who left his palatial villa smack in the middle of Rome to hang out in Victoria, Texas with his imported fancy breakfast wines and to dazzle the locals with his exotic accent and his sparkling gazelle eyes. As always, I hope you'll share your thoughts down in the comments. We read them all. Until next time, God in Texas, y'all. <laughs>